So this lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course, and we will be having a review of tensor products of modules over a ring. So the tensor product of two modules over a ring R is denoted like this. So here, this is the ring and M and N are modules. And this tensor product will also be a module over R. And um, this bit here is sometimes omitted um, if I'm feeling lazy or forgetful, as long as it's obvious what R is. Um, and first of all, we have to uh, define it, and then we will show how to calculate it. And then in later lectures, we will discuss the relation between tensor products and localization. So first of all, let's define it. So M tensor Rn is universal module for bilinear maps from M times N. So what on earth does this mean? What it means is that we're given a bilinear map from M times N to M tensor over Rn. So bilinear means if you hold something in N fixed, it's linear in M, and if you hold something in M fixed, it's linear in N. So the image of M N under this bilinear map is denoted by M tensor N. So first of all, we've got a bilinear map. And secondly, it's universal. This means if we've got any other bilinear map from M to a module A, so suppose we're given a bilinear map here, then there's a unique map from M tensor N to A, which is linear map, which is linear, making this diagram commute. So I just emphasize here that this map here is bilinear, and this map here is bilinear, but this map here is just linear. So what is happening is that bilinear maps from M times N to A are the same as linear maps from M tensor N to A. So, so the tensor product is a, is a kind of way of linearizing um, bilinear maps. Um, so now we have two problems. Um, about M tensor over Rn. First of all, is it unique and does it exist? So we've sort of defined it to be something with this property. Um, and for that to be a definition, uh, we need to show that there exists an essentially unique element with this property. And actually, it's not unique, but it's almost unique. So as we'll see in a moment, it's good enough. So, so let's first discuss uniqueness. So suppose we've got a bilinear map, so two modules M and N, and suppose we've got two tensor products. So one of them I'll denote by M tensor Rn, and let's denote the other one by a sort of square sign. And what I want to do is to show that these are essentially the same. Well, well by definition, these maps are bilinear. And now we want to show these, these are isomorphic. Well, first of all, this tensor product is universal for bilinear maps, which means there's a unique map from this one to this one, making the diagram commute. But then this is also universal. So there's a unique map from this to anything with a bilinear map from n times n. So there's a unique map going the other way, making the diagram commute. Now the composition of these two maps is a map from M tensor N to itself, making the sort of trivial diagram commute. So it must be the identity. So these maps must be inverses of each other. So, so these two are not only isomorphic, but there's a sort of canonical isomorphism between them. So any two 
tensor products are canonically isomorphic. And this is pretty much as good as uniqueness. Um, so if you can show that any two objects with some property are canonically isomorphic, then um, it, that, that means it's essentially unique. You know, sometimes in mathematics we get things where any two objects are isomorphic but not canonically isomorphic. For example, you know any field has an algebraic closure and any two algebraic closures are isomorphic but they're not actually canonically isomorphic. If you've got two algebraic closures then maybe lots of different isomorphisms between them and there's no clear way in which there's a best possible isomorphism. So, And th this actually causes some problems for algebraically closed fields. You can't quite talk about the algebraic closure of a field because the isomorphism between any two isn't canonical. Anyway, we don't have this pro problem for tensor products. That, that they're as close to being unique as you can get without actually being unique. So we just treat them as being unique. Now, what about existence? of a tensor product. Well, the existence is sort of trivial. We can just force existence as follows. So what we we need a map from M times N to M tensor N. And we're going to let M tensor N be the free module, so, so, so the free group generated, let's say free abelian group, generated by these elements M tensor N. And then we're going to quotient out by a whole bunch of relations. So we make R M tensor N minus R M tensor N. So, so again, um, not a billion, but this should be the free R module. Um, and then we tent quotient out by R M tensor N minus M tensor R N. And then we um, quotient out by M1 plus M2 tensor N minus M1 tensor N minus M2 tensor N. And we also quotient out by M tensor N1 plus N2 minus M tensor N1 minus M tensor n2. So what's going on here? First of all, um, this relation up here um, says uh, is um, um, just giving the image of m tensor n. So there is a homomorphism from m tensor n um, Sorry, so there is a map from the set M times N to M tensor N. Now, the point of these relations is they sort of make the map bilinear. So if the map here is bilinear, these relations have to be satisfied. And conversely, if you quotient out by all these relations, then this map becomes bilinear. So... This is, in some sense, a universal way of constructing a, um, a, a bilinear map from m times n to something. And it's kind of more or less trivial to check that this has the universal property. If we've got any map from m times n, any bilinear map from m times n to x, then we can extend, um, we can define a map from this set to it. So if this map is f, then we define the map just by mapping m tensor n to f of m n. And um, using these relations, you can show that this does actually give a linear map from this space here to x. So existence is kind of almost trivial. The trouble is this construction is completely useless in practice except for proving existence. The trouble is what we've taken is this huge R module generated by um, vast numbers of elements. 
Um, and we've quotient it out by another huge set of elements. So we've got some huge thing quotient out by another huge thing, and we have no idea what the result might be. Um, so um, we need to go, we need to provide a, a, a good way of calculating it. Um, well, first of all, before going on, I should add in a sort of warning. Um, this is a tensor product for commutative rings. For non-commutative rings, the tensor product is more subtle. Um, and I'll just mention what the problem is. Um, first of all, we, we define M tensor over R A N for M the right R module and N a left R module. And the relation we put in is M R tensor N is equal to M tensor R N. And the problem is this is only an abelian group not an R module. Um, the, the problem is, I mean, how are you going to define the R module structure on it? You can't multiply by M on the left by R because um, M doesn't have a left R module structure. And if you multiply by M on the right by R to give it its R module structure, it kind of gets messed up with, with this operation here. Um, you can um, make M tensor over R N into an R, R module, provided if M is a two-sided R module and N is a left R module, then M tensor over R N becomes a left R module. Because now you can use the left R module structure on M to define the action of R on this. In fact, um, tensor products for non-commutative rings are really tensor products, should really be done as tensor products of bimodules. So if M tensor over R N is an R bimodule, so, sorry, if M and N are R bimodules, so is M tensor over R N. And that's because you can use the left R module structure on M to make this into a left R module and the right R module structure on N similarly. And you can use the right R module structure on M and the left R module structure on N to define the tensor product. So for non-commutative rings, things really get rather more confusing. For commutative rings, any left module is automatically a bimodule in a canonical way, which is why for commutative rings, we can get away with defining tensor products of modules. Anyway, we won't be using tensor products of non-commutative rings, at least not very much. Um, now we're going to work out some examples. We're going to do tensor products of modules over vector spaces. and over Z, because these are the easiest cases to see what's going on. Um, well, as I said, we can't really use the construction we had before because it's too much of a mess. So what we do is we, first of all, write down some obvious properties of the tensor product and then use these to calculate it. First of all, M1 plus M2 tensor N is naturally isomorphic to M1 tensor N plus M2 tensor N. And this follows because bilinear maps from M1 plus M2 times N are the same as um, pairs consisting of a bilinear map from M one times n to something and a map from m2 times n to something 
and if you unravel this, you find this means the tensor product is sort of additive. And of course, um, the same applies for taking sums of, if, if n is a sum of two things, which I'm not going to write out because it's obvious. Secondly, r tensor over r of m is isomorphic to m. And again, this is because bilinear maps from r times m to, to x are the same as linear maps from m to x. Um, and now for vector spaces, we can um, figure this out, um, figure out tensor products. So we have k to the m tensor with k to the n is therefore isomorphic to k to the m n because we, the, this tensor product is just going to be the sum of um, m n copies of k tensored over k k, which we've seen is just isomorphic to k. Um, by the way, do not confuse the tensor product v tensor over w with v times w, here v w of vector spaces. So this is the tensor product and this is the ordinary product. And there is a relation between them. First of all, there is a natural map v times w to v tensor w. However, um, you should remember this map is not linear. It's only bilinear. Um, so if V has a basis, V1 up to Vm, and W has a basis, W1 up to Wn, then V times W has a basis, V1 up to Vm, W1 up to Wn. Whereas V tensor with W has a basis of the elements Vi tensor Wj. So um, here, there are m times n basis elements, and here there are m plus n basis elements. Um, now, let's work out tensor products of finitely generated abelian groups. So any finitely generated abelian group is a direct sum of um, copies of, of z and z over nz. So since the tensor product behaves very nicely with respect to direct sums, all we need to work out is the tensor product of z with z, the tensor product of z with z over nz, and the tensor product of z over mz with z over nz. And two of these are trivial. So this is just z, and this is just z over nz, because tensoring with our ring doesn't make any difference. So we've got to think a little bit about this one, though. Um, well, um, first of all, uh, this is generated by one tensor one. This is because if M is generated by elements M I and N by elements N J, then M tensor with N is generated by elements M I tensor N J, as you can easily check. So it's generated by one element. So it's going to be some sort of cyclic group. And let's try and work out what cyclic group it is. Well, first of all, we notice that M of one tensor one is equal to m of one tensor one, which is equal to um, which is equal to zero because um, m times um, one is zero in z over m z. Similarly, n of one tensor one is equal to zero because you can do the same trick on the right hand side. So um, um, the tensor products. So m n of one tensor one is equal to zero, where this is the um, greatest common um, 
greatest common denominator of m and n. Um, so uh, um, the tensor product z over mz tensor z over nz is at most z over m n z. And we can see it's actually equal to this because there is a bilinear map from z over mz times z over nz onto z over m n z, which just takes um, a b to a b. And this must factor through the tensor product by the universal pro property of the tensor product. So there must be a map from this map onto that map. And as the, the tensor product is at most equal to this in size, we see this must be an isomorphism. So z over mz tensor with z over nz is more or less z over mn. Z. And um, let's look at some special cases of it. We see in particular that z over mz tends to z over nz is equal to naught if m and n are co prime. So z over 2z tends to 3 over 3z is just zero and not z over 6z, as you might guess. Um, some other examples, let's just take, you know, z over 24z um, tensor with, um, say, z over um, 20z is just going to be z over 4z and so on. So it's very easy working out tensor products of abelian groups. Um, more generally for rings, you can see that R modulo i tends with R modulo j is isomorphic to R modulo, the ideal generated by i and j here. i and j are ideals of R. And more generally still, R over i tends with over R with any module m is just isomorphic to m over i m. So both of these are fairly easy to check in the same way that we did it for abelian groups. Um, so finally, I want to discuss the relation between tensor products and exactness. So suppose naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to naught is exact. And these are all R modules. Now let's tensor it with M. We can ask, is naught goes to A, tensor m goes to b tensor m goes to c tensor m goes to naught exact. And if this was so, it would make it be very, very convenient because we could then study the tensor product of b by studying the tensor products with a of a and c with m. And the answer is yes, if r is a field. Because if r is a field, then B is just isomorphic to A plus C. And we know that tensor products preserves, um, it sort of commutes with addition of modules. However, it's, the answer is no if R is Z. And we can see this for the following example. Let's look at the sequence naught goes to Z, goes to Z, goes to Z, modulo 2Z goes to naught, where this is multiplication by two. And what this is, this is, this is the universal counterexample to everything. So if you've got any statement about tensor products or modules or whatever else, Try it out on this example first before getting too excited about it, because this is this is a counterexample to about half the things people incorrectly believe about modules. Um, so uh, let's work out what the tensor products are. Let's just take the tensor product with z modulo two z and see what happens. Well, we get naught goes to 
Z modulo 2Z, because the tensor product of Z modulo 2Z with Z is just that. This goes to Z modulo 2Z, goes to Z modulo 2Z, goes to naught. And this map is okay, it's, it's just the identity map. And this map is multiplication by two, which is just the zero map. Um, so this map here is not injective. And we should cross out this naught here because it's um, no longer exact. Um, okay, this, this fact that when you take an exact sequence and tension it with the module, you need not get something that's exact is a really major problem in commutative algebra. In fact, there is an entire subject called homological algebra devoted solely to dealing with the problem that taking tensor products doesn't preserve exactness. Okay, so next lecture, we're going to discuss the relation between exactness and tensor products in a bit more detail. And in particular, we'll see that tensor products, taking tensor products preserves at least this bit of exactness, but not the, not the bit at the left. <laughs>